Hello. Today I'm going over show versus tell. Throughout the video I'll be putting text on the screen, so whenever I mention an example, something will probably be up. A show is when something is described, demonstrated, or paints a vivid image. A tell is when something is stated, declared, or makes a claim. You may have heard that a story should mostly be shows, and you may have heard some situations of when you should tell instead of show, or vice versa. But the answer of when is up to you, and what kind of story you're making. Let's take for example a character named Jim going to school. If I were to put this into a tell, it would be, Jim got ready for school and then walked to the bus stop. A very simple sentence to wrap up a mundane activity. Something like this should always be a tell, right? Here's the show version. Jim woke up after the fourth time his alarm went off. He slowly kicked off the blankets and rolled out of bed. The next door neighbors were already yelling and Jim just wanted to go back to sleep. He walked over to the pile of clothes on the floor, sniffed the first shirt he found, and crinkled his face. It still has another use in it, he said as he put it on, ignoring all the small holes on his shirt. He went to briefly brush his teeth. With one swipe of his fingers, his hair was fixed enough to his liking. After picking up his light backpack, he leisurely walked to the bus stop. It wasn't until he checked his phone that he realized school had already started. Damn, I have to walk. Or I could go back to bed. With this show, I took a mundane activity and used it to help establish character and environment. You got a sense of the character from how slowly he was getting ready, wearing a dirty, smelly shirt, how he didn't care about basic hygiene. All those point to him being a carefree slob. You get a feel for the environment with a small detail of his neighbors yelling, which implies thin walls, how messy his room must be if he has a pile of clothes sitting on the floor. I started setting up that he's poor when you combine the thin walls, the shirt with holes, and the lack of parental figure around, along with him needing to walk to school. This show would be great at the beginning of the story to get a sense of what's normal to the main character, but this would be awful if it was in the middle of what's supposed to be an action thriller. I'm going to go over examples of both shows and tells from various books, and I'll pause a moment for you to try to figure out if it's a tell or if it's a show. From Bird Box, this was once a nice house in a nice suburb of Detroit. This is a tell. From John Dies at the End, I was pondering that riddle as I reclined on my porch at 3 a.m., a chilled breeze numbing my cheeks and earlobes and flicking, tingling hairs across my forehead. I had my feet up on the railing, leaning back in one of those cheap plastic lawn chairs, the kind that blows out onto the lawn during every thunderstorm. This is a show. Back to Bird Box. The children have never seen the world outside their home, not even through the windows, and Mallory hasn't looked in more than four years. Four years. She does not have to make this decision today. This is a tell. From House of Leaves, I'm so tired. Sleep's been stalking me for too long to remember. Inevitable, I suppose. Sadly, though, I'm not looking forward to the prospect. I say sadly because there was a time when I actually enjoyed sleeping. In fact, I slept all the time. This is a tell. From Harry Potter. As they entered November, the weather turned very cold. The mountains around the school became icy gray and the lake like chilled steel. Every morning, the ground was covered in frost. Hagrid could be seen from the upstairs windows, defrosting broomsticks on the Quidditch field, bundled up in a long mold-skin overcoat, rabbit fur gloves, and enormous beaver skin boots. This is both a show and a tell. The tell portion is the sentence at the beginning. As they entered November, the weather turned very cold. Everything else is a show. Back to John Dies at the end. Let's say you have an axe, just a cheap one from Home Depot. On one bitter winter day, you use said axe to behead a man. Don't worry, the man was already dead. Or maybe you should worry because you're the one who shot him. He had been a big, twitchy guy with veiny skin stretched over swollen biceps, a tattoo of a swastika on his tongue, teeth filled with razor-sharp fangs, you know the type, and you're chopping off his head because, even with eight bullets in him, you're pretty sure he's about to spring back to his feet and eat the look of terror off your face. This is both. Let's say you have an axe, just the cheap one from Home Depot, 
On one bitter winter day, you used that axe to behead a man. Don't worry, the man was already dead, or maybe you should worry because you're the one who shot him. These are all tells. The rest are shows. Hopefully you have a better understanding of what's a show and what's a tell, how they mix together, and how they can work and not work. On to the advice portion of this video. Most of the time you want to show feelings rather than tell them. Which do you think is better? Susie is sad or Susie had tears running down her face? Which do you think connects better to the audience? Being told Susie is sad or being shown Susie is sad? What about with this example? Vin is in love or Vin hummed songs as he was buying beautiful pink flowers for Jane. Do not be redundant with a tell followed by a show, most of the time. With my example from Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling had, as they entered November, the weather turned very cold, followed by her showing cold weather. But if I were to say, shit hit the fan, the oven broke and the turkey was still uncooked, Mike dropped one of the pies on the floor, and Claire was yelling at her ex-husband for cheating on her three years ago. It becomes completely redundant to say, shit hit the fan, when you go on to explain how shit hit the fan in the next sentence. One reason why I think it's okay to be a little bit redundant, like JK Rowling was, was because she was writing middle grade stories and she was using that sentence as a transition. Another reason why it would be okay would be because of style, which I'll go over style in a different video. Choosing when and how to be specific. You could be thinking you're showing something when in reality you're just telling. Brandon Sanderson talks about the pyramid of abstraction in one of his lectures where the top of the pyramid is abstract with vague wording and the bottom is concrete details. I'll link that down below for you to check out on your own. But for this little bit, I'm going to read from Gary Provost's book, Make Every Word Count. I know a girl who was attacked by a dog yesterday. I know another girl who was attacked by a Doberman pincer. Which dog can you see more clearly? The vague general dog or the specific dog? Which attack is more believable? In the case of the dog attacking the girl, I could say the dog was a black Doberman pincer with a broken chain dangling from his neck, blood on his teeth, one ear missing from a previous fight, and the letter L carved on his rump. All of this would etch a picture of the dog more deeply on the reader's imagination. This would be great if I were writing a description for the policeman who's got to hunt the dog down, but assuming this is a story or a newspaper report, the more I belabor the dog, the more it becomes what the passage is about, and I'm really trying to tell you about an attack, not a dog. So instead of going on and on about this angry beast, I try to create a sharply focused image with one or two specific words such as vicious or enraged. Still alone with her fears, Jennifer rose from the table, coffee cup in hand, and gazed out the kitchen window. Now a window is a fairly general kind of thing, and I could show it to you much better by saying it was a stained glass window, or a three inch window, or a window made out of old pickle jars. All of those things would make the window more specific. Unfortunately, they also make the window a freak, because windows are all pretty much the same. Unlike a dog, one window usually looks very much like another. Stained glass windows, tiny windows, and windows that have little chipmunks painted on them clash with the reader's expectations. You weren't shocked to find out that the dog that attacked a girl was a Doberman, but you were probably so taken aback when you entered Jennifer's otherwise ordinary kitchen for the first time and found 82 pickle jars for a window that you probably forgot all about her fears, which were supposed to be the important thing. The takeaway from this, I would say, is be specific if you want to bring attention to it, if focusing on something plays a big role. I'll go to another passage from Gary Provost's book that talks about what being specific entails. You may have heard somewhere that if there is a gun on the wall in chapter one, it should always be shot by the last chapter. That's not literally true, but the idea behind it is correct. If there is a gun on the wall in chapter one, the reader should, by the end of the book, have some sort of idea why you mentioned it, but didn't, for example, mention the color of the rug. Maybe the gun will be used to shoot somebody in chapter seven. Maybe the gun is an expensive make, and you're trying to convey a sense of affluence. Or maybe you're trying to characterize somebody as having a, a gun collector's mentality. 
or the gun is the only object a young woman has that belonged to her father, or the gun is covering a button on the wall that opens a secret door. The gun certainly doesn't have to be fired, but there should be some reason why you put it in there in fiction or why you chose to mention it in nonfiction. My next advice would be keep descriptions short, describe the unusual, and be selective. People and things have an assortment of attributes you can use to describe them, but no one wants to read a list of things. An example from Bird Box, this, Tom says, is the living room. We hang out a lot in here. Mallory turns to see his hand is gesturing towards the larger room. There is a couch, an end table with a telephone on it, lamps, an easy chair, carpet, a calendar is drawn in what looks like marker on the wall between framed paintings. The windows are covered by hanging black blankets. Although it's a short description, this is just a list. And people already have an idea of what a living room looks like, so the details seem extra boring. The interesting bits are the unusual things, the calendar drawn on the wall, and the windows being covered by black blankets. Let's go back to the example from John Dies at the End. He had been a big, twitchy guy with veiny skin stretched over swollen biceps, a tattoo of a swastika on his tongue, teeth filled with razor-sharp fangs, you know the type. This is filled with unusual traits, so it being a little bit more like a list doesn't matter. It's short, and you know, it could have gone into details with how big the man was, like saying his exact height or how wide he was, or by adding color to the veins or texture to the skin, maybe it was leathery, the tattoo could have been more in detail, showing the age with faded color or being badly drawn. The teeth could have been more in detail with, you know, again, color or if any were missing. But it didn't drone on and on with details and it kept it short. And I believe that's part of what makes it work. Fantasy and sci-fi genres are where you wouldn't want your descriptions to be short as it's filled with nothing but the unknown and unusual and the target audience usually wants all the details of the world. For why you would want to be selective, uh, here's another passage from Gary Provost's book. For example, if I just want you to see the trousers that a man is wearing, I could tell you their color, blue, the fabric they are made of, denim, or the price he paid for them. He came in wearing $80 jeans. But description usually involves getting greater goals than that. If I wanted you to look at the pants as an aspect of this man's sexuality, his attractiveness, the detail I choose might be tight. It doesn't take any more words to write tight jeans than it does to write blue jeans or denim jeans, but I have gotten more for my words by choosing the detail that does the work I want it to do. What you show could be improved with active verbs and character interaction. And I'm reading more from Gary Provost's book because I'm a little more iffy with the whole active verbs. He starts off with an example. The house on Willie Street was white stucco with a red clay roof, a clone of every other house on the street. There was a pair of newly planted Malaysian dwarf palms on the square lawn. There was a stone owl in front of the door, the name under the doorbell, was Frances Perring. She was 60-ish and tan. She wore bifocals. Her laugh was hoarse. The house was small. It looked like a very neat apartment. The living room was very colorful. On the sideboard, there were bright ceramic pots and homemade painted planters with plastic flowers in them. There were several lamps in the room. There was also a bookcase. Now here is the static description brought to life through the use of active verbs and motion pictures. The house on Widely Street was white stucco with a red clay roof, a clone of every other house on the street. A pair of newly planted Malaysian dwarf palms stood ground on the small square lawn and a stone owl sat in front of the door. The name Frances Perang had been carefully printed under the doorbell. She was 60-ish and tan. Her bifocals twinkled as she tipped her head to get a better look. She laughed a hoarse laugh. The house felt smaller inside. It felt not like a house at all, but like an apartment where everything is neatly placed because the residents have nothing but housework to do. The living room was a crowd of colors, each battling for dominance. It was filled with bright ceramic pots and sideboards, homemade and hand-painted planters filled with plastic flowers and things that dangled from the ceiling and tickled when you walked by them. 
There were also enough lamps to eliminate a night baseball game. Frances poured the wine while I fingered her bookcase. And here is the static description brought to life and given forward motion by being sprinkled into the current as the action of the story flows by. The house on Wildly Street was white stucco with a red clay roof, a clone of every other house on the street. A pair of newly planted Malaysian dwarf palms stood guard on the small square lawn, and a stone owl sat in front of the door. The name Francis Perang had been carefully printed under the doorbell. She came to the door and peered through the screen. She was 60-ish and tan. Her bifocals twinkled as she tipped her head to get a better look. What do you want? She said in a voice so husky you could almost hear the Pollocks knocking together. Hi, my name is Randy Chase. What do you want? I'm a reporter for the Scream. Yeah, so what do you want? I want to talk to you about your husband getting knocked off. I said, it was not a very tactful thing to say, but she didn't strike me as the grieving widow. She laughed a hoarse laugh. You've got a lot of kaputs saying a thing like that. The poor bastard's not even buried yet. You sure got kaputs. You know what kaputs is, huh? Do you know what kaputs is? She seemed oddly familiar to me now. I was sure I had this conversation before. Something like balls, isn't it? Francis laughed again. Yeah, that's what it is. Exactly. Balls. Come on in. You're okay. She pushes the screen door open and welcomed me to the shady coldness of her foyer. You want some wine? She said. I followed her into the living room. I was just having some. Nothing fancy. Just some cherry crap Asa always had around. I drink it with ice. The house felt smaller inside. It felt not like a house at all but like an apartment where everything is neatly in place because the residents have nothing but housework to do. The living room was a crowd of colors, each battling for dominance. It was filled with bright ceramic pots and sideboards, homemade and hand-painted planters sprouting plastic flowers and things that dangled from the ceiling and tinkled when you walked by them. There were also enough lamps to eliminate a night baseball game. While Francis poured the wine, I fingered her bookcase. To wrap up everything, showing is how you can immerse the reader, make them feel like they are in the world, like they know the characters. Telling is great to help streamline information, too boring to show, or saying something that would normally bring attention away from the focus of the story. It's a balance between the two that you have to figure out. And that covers this very long video of show versus tell. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my video. I hope it was helpful. Don't forget to wear sunscreen. And I hope to see you again. Bye for now.